Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. All right, today, today we're going to talk about diabetes, <laughs> type 2 diabetes specifically, and how it relates to testosterone therapy. And I'm going to make the case, supported by the evidence, that testosterone therapy should be considered, if not first line, I think it probably should be, but if not first line, then certainly as an adjunct and uh, second line treatment for treatment of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, this is a huge problem. So type 2 diabetes and of course the obesity that typically goes with it, th this is going to break the back of the U.S. healthcare system. It's already doing it at this point. Um, I've talked about this in other, in other talks. Um, this is from the National Diabetes Statistics Report. This, this is as of 2019. Um, and I suspect that this is, these numbers are conservative, and they're actually much worse than that. But currently, 11.3% of the U.S. population has full-blown type 2 diabetes that has been diagnosed. Okay? But what's scary is 96 million people, adults, uh, which is 38% of the U.S. adult population, has prediabetes. So you put those two numbers together, and you're approaching a, a 50% diabetes or pre-diabetes rate as of right now. Now, um, I, again, I suspect that it's much higher. If you look at the, the older demographic, like 65 and older, according to this report, it's almost 50, almost 50 percent. So 48.8 percent of adults in the United States, 65 and older, have type 2 diabetes. And again, I suspect, just based on what I see in the ER, um, I suspect that that number is actually quite a, quite a bit higher than that. And what is our largest demographic currently in this country, right? It's these, all these boomers that um, are 65 and older. That, that is a huge cohort of individuals. So that's, there's a huge burden of type 2 diabetes within that population. But what's going to be even worse, I predict, is their grandkids. And I've talked about this also in other podcasts. But there's estimates by the CDC that by 2050, the number of diabetics in the United States, if it's 11.3% now, they're estimating that it's going to be 33%, you know, or one in three. And again, I'm telling you, I, I predict it's going to be quite a bit higher than that. So you can imagine in 2050, you know, if we're at a 50% pre-diabetic plus diabetic rate, you're probably going to be looking at 75 to 85% of the entire U.S. population is either full-blown diabetic or pre-diabetic which is terrifying. So that's why I say the system is going to collapse. There's, there's nothing that can be done. There's no system, whether it's socialized, whether it's fee for service, wh whatever, whatever system you wanna create, when you have 80% of the population being diabetic or pre-diabetic and very likely morbidly obese along with that, there, there's no system that can sustain that and take, uh, do a good job taking care of those people, especially without making major sacrifices in other areas like defense, like infrastructure, you know, you name it. It's, um, it's going to be an unsustainable thing. So that's why I'm telling you guys, you've got to get healthy. You've got to be so healthy that you can avoid the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, the root cause of this, the biggest risk factor for type 2 diabetes is what? Right here. This is it. Tess Holiday is the biggest risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Not really, but obesity is the, is the biggest risk factor. It accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of the risk. If you address obesity, you go a really long way to preventing type 2 diabetes. It's, it's a huge, huge problem. And that's why this whole like fat or sorry, healthy at every size um, movement is, is so disturbing to me because it's going to come back and bite people in the butt, you know, so to speak. And it reminds me of this famous quote by Ayn Rand says we can evade reality, but we cannot evade the consequences of evading reality. So right now, you know, I don't know anything about Tess Holliday's health. I, I bet it's not good. Um, but right now she's in, in the mode where she's, she is um, evading reality, at least in her mind. Um, she thinks, she probably thinks she's okay, but she's not obviously. And she is not going to avoid the consequences of her current evasion of reality. It will catch up with her eventually. It always does. So, um, you know, th there's no such thing as health at every size. I see a ton of type 2 diabetics in the emergency department. Most of them have already been diagnosed, but there's a substantial portion of people that come in. They'll come in for some other thing. And 
you know, on their blood work, you know, they'll have a blood sugar of 350 and they'll have no idea that they were type two diabetic. And they always say, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, I have been peeing a lot actually. And I've been, I actually have been pretty thirsty and they had no idea. Or maybe they were told, you know, 10 years ago that they were pre-diabetic. Uh, or my favorite is that they were diagnosed with diabetes, but uh, don't worry doc, it's, I, I control it with diet as they sit there like 290 pounds in front of me, you know, and I get their blood sugar back and it's like 400 and their hemoglobin A1C is like 13, you know, in the emergency department. So um, I end up like diagnose, I end up diagnosing a lot of type two diabetes and I end up initiating therapy in the emergency department um, for these people just to get them started because even though I'm not their primary care doctor, you know, I do refer them to their primary care doc, you know, to kind of take the ball from there and, and, you know, continue treatment for them. But it's tough. Like some of these people don't have primary care doctors and, um, or it can be, it can be months before they can get in to see a primary care doctor because, you know, they're extremely busy and we have a nationwide shortage of, of primary care physicians. There's just not enough of them going around. So, um, you know, and I can't let them run around with blood sugars of 400. Uh, so I will end up starting them on therapy. When I have a patient like that, I, I always enjoy it when I have a medical student or um, an intern or resident with me because it gives us a chance to kind of go over, you know, what do the current guidelines say? What should we start this patient on? You know, how, um, how effective are the different medicines in terms of lowering hemoglobin A1C, which is the main measure that uh, their primary care doc will be, will be following. Most of the time, it, you know, the, the students are pretty sharp. Like they, they know all the different classes and most of them know roughly how much, you know, the A1C will lower, you know, per, per drug because, you know, they learn that in school. This is a chart right here that shows the average hemoglobin A1C decline for the different classes of medications and they're color coded here. And what you can see here is like, so metformin is, uh, metformin is the, the, the drug of choice to for the vast majority of people that are newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes this is this is what you start with and you can expect if they're compliant with uh, a gram of metformin usually twice a day you can expect about a one point or one percentage point drop in hemoglobin a1c which is pretty darn good for for a single drug and then you can go down the list here most of them are a little bit less than that so you're somewhere between like uh, 0.5 drop um, to just a little bit over one with the exception of the these new GLP-1 agonists that you know you're hearing about for weight loss th these are remarkably effective um, you know here we have uh, so you know the, a, a milligram of semaglutide is associated with a 1.7 percent drop in hemoglobin A1c which is uh, as, which is by far the best out of all of these they're very expensive uh, so they're not considered first line but they're an excellent second line choice, um, assuming the patient can afford them. So, um, so anyway, so so this is the list here. Um, but you know, in general, like if if you can get a 0.5 to a 1% drop in a in the hemoglobin A1C with with a particular uh, drug, that's that's you're doing pretty well. Um, you're doing pretty well with that. So here is, this is the algorithm from the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. This is their, based off their, their latest guidelines, which I believe were a couple years ago, I think they came out. And we're not gonna go through the whole thing because it's, it's obviously a very busy slide, but you know, like I just mentioned, it says right here, first line therapy is metformin. And then of course, comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity, all right. So metformin and stop stuff in your pie hole and get out and exercise. <laughs> it's basically what that says. Um, they don't give specific recommendations on what, what what a good weight management program should look like, which is the main problem because most doctors have absolutely no idea how to write a exercise prescription. They have no idea how to prescribe a weight loss diet to a patient. So uh, this is sort of lip service, but uh, what they do know how to do is prescribe metformin. So. And then from there, you know, if the patient's not at, at their goal, which, you know, probably are not going to be, you know, with, with just metformin, um, then depending on other comorbidities and other factors that are at play, you know, that, that will dictate what the choice of your second drug is. So for example here, you know, if you've got chronic kidney disease or, or coronary artery disease, you know, that gives you the option of uh, one of these new SGL2 uh, inhibitors, which are awesome drugs. 
uh, or GLP-1 agonists. Over here on the right side, if cost is a major issue, so we have a lot of uninsured people, um, people are homeless, and uh, we're on uh, you know a very tight budget. You can use an old school sulfonylurea, which you know we try not to do that anymore because all these other drugs are far superior to that. But anyway, you you can see the chart here. It, it, you have options for your second line. What's interesting about this? Nowhere on this list and nowhere on this algorithm is testosterone therapy. There's no mention in here at all about screening for hypogonadism or low or suboptimal testosterone. And I find that interesting because over the years, I have seen some remarkable um, improvements in glycemic control in type 2 diabetes patients who have been placed on testosterone and who also obviously take the lifestyle part of it uh, seriously. So they exercise, they watch what they eat. I mean, I've seen uh, on many occasions, more than I can count, um, people essentially put their diet, their type 2 diabetes completely into remission. They get their hemoglobin A1C under six. And, um, you know, as long as they, as long as they stay, stay on the program, they, they remain essentially non-diabetic, which is really impressive. Um, but it's nowhere on this list. So I wonder why that is. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, there are there is a plethora of studies showing the benefits of testosterone therapy in type 2 diabetes in terms of glycemic control in terms of lipids in terms of cardiovascular disease uh, i just had to just pick a small handful of them because there are dozens and dozens of them out there more more than i could ever put into a talk so i just want to go over just a few of them and Specifically, we're going to talk about the A1C reduction and we're going to compare it to these other standard type 2 diabetes drugs. And you can see where testosterone kind of falls into, into the picture there. So this first one is from the article Aging Mail, which is actually, this is a great journal actually. I get a lot of good stuff from, from the Aging Mail journal. And this is uh, the impact of testosterone replacement therapy on glycemic control, vascular function, components of the metabolic syndrome, and obese hypogonadal men with type 2 diabetes. So they, you know, we're going to just talk about the A1C, but they looked at a lot of other factors, all of which improved, by the way. Um, on testosterone therapy. So this is a, this is a good double-blind placebo-controlled clinical study. They took 55 obese uh, males that they had overt hypogonadism, you know, by endocrine society definition. Uh, so there was no question that these men had low, low testosterone. And they, um, they put them on testosterone and undecanoate, so the, which is the long-acting um, testosterone ester, different than cypionate and enthate and propionate, which is the shortest one. Um, and they did that thousand, they gave them a big, like a gram of testosterone undecanoate every 10 weeks, which um, seems to be a popular regimen in some of these studies. But um, then they followed these guys out for, yeah, these ones they followed out for a year. So this study was from, it's relatively new, yeah, this is a 2018 study from Aging Male. And then this is a chart here looking at what happened to the hemoglobin A1C. So on the left, we see where it's down here where it says P, that's the placebo group. So the placebo group started with an A1C of 7.89. And, um, you know, they did get like counseling on exercise and lifestyle in both groups. So they got a little bit of a drop. They went down to 7.65. Uh, you know, modest reduction in their hemoglobin A1C. And then uh, the treatment group, however, they started off a bit higher, 8.12, and they went all the way down to 7.18 on average. So nearly nearly a, a full percentage point, not quite, but a full 1% drop in hemoglobin A1C, which right up there with metformin, right? At least in this particular study. So not, not too bad, not too bad. So uh, but let's see, let's see if there's other studies that can reproduce this. So another study from Aging Male, they do a lot of testosterone studies in Aging Male for, for some reason. Um, this, is, um, the, uh, this is testosterone treatment longer than one year. So the first one was for a year. They took this one out to two years to see if the effect would be sustained. It was a very similar protocol. They followed these guys for two years. They used a gram of uh, testosterone undecanoate and they uh, looked at a bunch of different factors just like in the last study but they followed them out for two years um, instead of one year and this is a 2020 study so this is kind of like a follow-up to the last one and this is a chart taken from that study so as you can see I mean they looked at a lot of different parameters here you know they looked at um, 
not just hemoglobin A1C, but the HOMA IR, which is, we're not going to get into that, but that's a measure of insulin resistance. They looked at their lipids, they looked at blood pressure, they looked at their weight, they looked at their waist circumference, uh, a lot of different things. But the take home in here is that, um, so in terms of hemoglobin A1C, average starting hemoglobin A1C in the treatment group was 8.12, and then the average after 24 months, two years of treatment, 6.6 .6 for for a minus 1.5% drop over the course of two years, in addition to like diet and lifestyle counseling, of course. So that's a 1.5% drop in hemoglobin A1C, which puts it right up there with these GLP-1 agonists, at least based on this particular study. And just to give you an idea of what the baseline testosterone levels were on these guys, um, I have those highlighted down here. This is t what it says, TT. Now it's in nanomoles per liter, which my brain just doesn't function in nanomoles per liter. So next to it, I wrote what that is in nanograms per deciliter. So they started off with an average total testosterone. They didn't, um, I didn't look into what their free was, but 209, so pretty damn low. Uh, even, you know, even the most conservative endocrinologists would agree these men are hypogonadal. And then they brought them up to an average of 677 so you know a, a very healthy decent total testosterone level uh, in these men and you know uh, what I would consider a very impressive drop in their hemoglobin A1C by roughly 1.5 percent so um, this next study this is um, also using testosterone undecanoate these guys they love to use their undecanoate I think they just do it because you know, instead of enanthate or cypionate, just because it's just easier to have these patients come in and get a shot uh, and they can monitor compliance because the shots are given in the clinic as opposed to having them go off and like do their own shots at home and you know not know if they're taking it or if they, they're missing a dose. I think that's why they're using undecanoate. Um, but anyway, this is uh, from the International Journal of Endocrinology. This is a 2014 article, effects of a five-year treatment with testosterone undecanoate on metabolic and hormonal parameters in aging men with metabolic syndrome. So even longer. So now we're going out to five years. And again, we're still seeing sustained benefit. The longer things go, the longer you're on testosterone therapy, these, um, these hemoglobin A1C uh, benefits, uh, they persist, they, they, they don't go away, which is, which is great. So um, I highlighted here, so glycosylated hemoglobin dropped by 1.6% in this particular study. Uh, over the course of five years. And then, you know, they looked at other things too. They had significant reductions in waist circumference, body weight, um, uh, and HOMA IR, which is again, a, a different way to measure insulin sensitivity. So last one was 1.5% over two years. This is 1.6% on average over five years. A lot, the original one over one year is was 1%. So it almost seems like the longer you go, the the more benefit you continue to get. Again, there's tons of other studies, you know, that essentially showed the same thing. They all show weight loss. They all show a decrease in, in uh, waist circumference. So presumably they're losing a significant amount of body fat. The ones that looked at lipids all showed benefits in lipids. And the ones that looked at other cardiac risk factors uh, other than lipids, uh, they all showed improvement, and all of them that looked at sexual function and mood also showed benefits in that department too. So it's hard to find a, di a, a, a type 2 diabetes drug that will do also do all of those other things for you, uh, like testosterone will. And then the last study I want to show you here, this is a huge, huge meta-analysis, uh, type 2 diabetes and testosterone therapy, World Journal of Men's Health, this is dated 2019. So they reviewed 1,700 articles, which included 52 clinical trials and 32 randomized controlled trials on testosterone therapy and in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And they came up with some really good, I think very profound consensus statements after looking at all this literature. One of the first things they mentioned here, in 2015, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which is different than the Endocrine Society, by the way, so this American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommended that all men with type 2 diabetes should be screened for hypogonadism along with all men with a body mass index greater than 30. Now, 
every single one of the, uh, almost every single one of the diabetics that I see in the emergency department, I, I rarely see a man, and I have access to all of their labs on our electronic medical record going back basically as long as they've been in our system. It's, it's rare for me to see that anybody's ever checked a testosterone level on these men. It just, it just is not, it's just not something that's on the radar of most family medicine docs, most uh, internal medicine docs. And, um, you know, and, and according to the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, th that should be the standard of care. Now, what's interesting is that the Endocrine Society actually disagrees with them. And they, they advise against screening for hypogonadism in men that are obese or have type 2 diabetes routinely. You know, the, the, obviously, if you think it's clinically indicated, I doubt that they'd have an issue with it. But it, they don't have an official statement out there, to my knowledge, um, recommending that this be done routinely, which I have to disagree with. You know, I don't disagree with the endocrine society that often because, <laughs> you know, I think they're, they're pretty much on point with most stuff. But, um, you know, given how effective testosterone therapy is and how important it is to, the, to a man's overall health, I think that screening, you know, at-risk populations of men, I think, is a good idea, and um, the American Association of or Association of Clinical Endocrinologists um, is in agreement with that. So I'm glad I'm glad there's at least one group out there in the United States that um, is pushing for this. Okay, this is a quote from their the conclusions of this very lengthy paper, um, and there's some really important things here. Uh, we'll start off with the, their opening paragraph. The low levels of testosterone frequently seen in men with type 2 diabetes are associated with increased comorbidity and mortality. Studies with testosterone therapy suggest significant benefits in sexual function, quality of life, glycemic control, anemia, bone density, fat, and lean muscle mass. Name me, a, name me one other type 2 diabetes drug that does all of that for you. There isn't any. They might do some of those things, but not, not all of them in the way that testosterone can do it. And this first sentence is really important. Type 2 diabetes is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. You know, type 2 diabetes is, it is a really serious disease. It can be difficult to get a handle on. There, there are so many serious complications from type 2 diabetes that, you know, my thought on it is why wouldn't you use everything in your arsenal, you know, from the standard anti-hyperglycemic medications that we have now, why wouldn't you also consider testosterone? Knowing how effective it is and knowing the excellent safety profile that it has when it's, when it's dosed and uh, monitored properly by a physician who knows what they're doing, you know, given the seriousness of this condition, I, 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 would, you know, I would think as a physician, you would want to use every, every available option to treat that condition. Yet, you know, when when you ask the endocrine society about this and, and you look at the even the European guidelines, it's sort of like crickets. There's there's no mention of testosterone whatsoever. And then this final statement here, this they, they won some points with me here. Okay. It says restricting therapy to men with classical hypogonadism is not supported by the evidence. So one of the things they mentioned in this lengthy article was, you know, you do not have to have overt hypogonadism as defined by current endocrine society guidelines to benefit from testosterone therapy in terms of treatment of your type 2 diabetes. So even men that are in like the bottom quartile, for example, so say, you know, around 350, um, which most physicians in the U.S. would say you're normal and there's no indication to treat you uh, with testosterone therapy. There's no potential for benefit. Um, they they prove in this article that that's not true. That those men still benefit significantly from testosterone therapy, even with levels that are in the quote normal range. Okay, so I, I love that they said that because it's true. Um, the results of lifestyle intervention as sole therapy for hypogonadism in type 2 diabetes are disappointing. <laughs> Ooh, that's an understatement. Listen, losing weight's hard. Getting your sugars under control um, is very difficult. You know, there, there's a, don't take this the wrong way. If you're a type 2 diabetic, there's a reason you're a type 2 diabetic. You know, there's a reason. And you know what it is. You know what I'm going to say. It's not just your genes, okay? You've been making bad choices every single day mostly unconsciously, but perhaps consciously, for many, many, many years, 
And all of that has led to you finally developing type 2 diabetes. Okay, there's a component of that that is not your fault. I'm not going to get into that. I understand it. Um, but there is a huge component of that uh, condition that is your fault. Uh, I am a uh, former military officer. I agree with Jocko Willink and I, when he says everything is your fault. I think everything is your fault. Even when it's not your fault, there's still a component of it that you have some control over. So, yeah, it is very difficult to, uh, to lose weight and um, the lifestyle intervention on its own, most people are just not willing to do it. When I was doing primary care full time, in a three year span in one particular clinic that I worked in, I had one man, I had one patient out of thousands who lost weight, and reversed his type 2 diabetes, put it into remission with diet and lifestyle alone. That was it. It was one guy. Um, so anyway, I don't want to harp on that too much, but moving on, they finish up here by saying, the balance of evidence suggests that men with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hypogonadism are likely to benefit from testosterone therapy combined with lifestyle intervention. Yeah, absolutely. The two of those, it, there is such a, an amazing synergy if if you get your act together and you start eating like you're supposed to, if you start exercising, and I mean, you know, I don't mean going for a walk, okay? Walking is not exercise, walking is transportation. So getting on an exercise program, preferably a serious high intensity resistance training program where you're lifting weights and you are uh, actively trying to grow muscle tissue. When you combine that with testosterone therapy and let's say metformin, that is an amazing, amazing combination that when all of those factors are in, in the mix and working together, I pers I've seen like just some really incredible dramatic changes in, in, in people's lives. A lot of that requires effort on your part. And you know, I, I could prescribe you testosterone. <laughs> I can prescribe you metformin. I do that on a regular basis, but you know what? I can't, I can't pick you up in my car and take you to the gym. All right. I can't come to your house and cook for you. You definitely don't want me to come to, to your house and cook for you. <laughs> Trust me on that. But you know what I mean? Like you, you have got to do your part on that. But when you do, when you get, when you take this thing seriously, and when you combine it with appropriate medical treatment like metformin, like testosterone therapy, um, the results can be really amazing. Okay, guys. So let me finish up here by showing you once again this this list here of some of most of the standard type 2 diabetes medications and their A1C lowering properties. So remember, the studies I just showed you showed a decline in hemoglobin A1C of roughly 1%, maybe a little bit less than 1%, all the way up to 1.5%. Now compare that to these other drugs here. You know, testosterone compares very favorably, very favorably in terms of A1C lowering with every single one of these. It's right up there with the GLP-1 drugs, okay? It's, um, it's right up there with metformin, and um, I would argue that it's probably safer than both of those drugs when dosed and monitored properly under the supervision of a physician who knows what the hell they're doing. So I'm gonna humbly suggest to the American Diabetes Association and their European colleagues, you know, not that, they've, not that they're knocking on my door asking for my opinion, but I'm gonna humbly suggest that maybe when their new guidelines come out, that maybe up there at the top they insert, maybe in just some fine print, maybe with a small asterisk, consider testosterone therapy in addition to metformin um, as first line for type 2 diabetes. Okay guys, that's all I got for you today. If you are a type 2 diabetic, you've not had your testosterone level checked, I want you to turn off YouTube, I want you to make an appointment with your doctor, and I want you to go get tested. Okay, it might make a huge difference for you. All right, guys, I'll catch you next time. Bye. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. 
You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.